afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Cerulean Radix Bay 5G monetization webinar. Thank you for all for joining. So just uh, a couple of housekeeping rules. We have a moderator on with us for this webinar. Uh, Jolene will be monitoring questions being raised by the attendees. There is a handout which you should be able to access at the, the top right of your screen under the handouts tab. And that is a more detailed view of the subject matter and the issues that we're going to be talking about today around how to leverage the advantages of the new sort of 5G infrastructure and what sort of business models digital service providers should be looking to focus in on over the next five years. But first and foremost, thank you all for joining. It's the middle of, middle of the afternoon where you are. I just want to start off with a brief round of introductions. So my name is James Savelli Holt. I head up the Americas for Cerulean. So I, I have a sort of multifaceted role that it is predominantly sort of account management and sales. I'm also joined on the Cerulean side by Jolie Neo, who's one of our technical pre-sales consultants who will be managing questions that arise from the audience. And then I'm also joined by our sort of co-sponsors, Radix Bay. So on the Radix Bay side, I'm joined with RJ Fabian, who's their senior director for advisory services, and also Christopher Foote, who's on the senior director staff for Radix Bay. And before we go into the presentation, we're going to spend quite a lot of time in software demonstrations. We have a few slides to cover off, but really they serve as an anchor point going forward. But we really want to talk to you about how you can leverage BSS to better serve your 5G customers and essentially monetize it in the best way forward. But there's a, a couple of slides that I think RJ is going to take you through now. And um, yeah, we'll go from there. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, James. And this time I'll, I'll come off mute to say what I have to say. So uh, I do want to just give a quick introduction of Radix Bay. We are a US-based US consulting firm headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we offer a broad range of business and IT services. One of our unique offerings is our uh, rural shore delivery model. We have a development and testing center in Tabor City, North Carolina, which allows us to offer uh, offshore type services from an onshore location with a very competitive pricing. We, our firm has some specialties, um, Oracle, um, Salesforce practices, and with our development center uh, in Tabor City, uh, managed services and application lifecycle. On the advisory services side, um, I head up that practice, as I said, we have some very senior consultants who can leverage their deep experiences to solve a, a wide variety of business and IT problems Frequently, we get involved helping businesses to identify and select applications to support their business needs, uh, which is uh, a big part of why we're here today. Um, we have, uh, in the past year or so, helped one of our clients, led them through a selection process, and are now helping them to uh, implement the Cerulean application. So that's the Radix Bay introduction, James. I'll turn it back over to you. So uh, a very, very quick uh, introduction to Cerulean. Uh, as you know, some some within the audience may know us, uh, some may not. Um, so we started off at the you know the peak of the dot com bubble in in 1999. Managed to survive that, um, and we've we've really grown sort of you know, steadily since then, um, a, a major milestone in our sort of corporate history has been going public in 2016 on the London Stock Exchange. Um, and as a company, I guess the DNA of the company is, it's always been centered on BSS OSS. Um, and we attack the market from a slightly different angle as some of the larger, some of our larger competitors, you know, Oracle, Ericsson, Huawei, et cetera. We had the idea that, um, the best way to deliver BSS was not a best of breed, a classic sort of systems integration, 
approach where you would get Siebel to talk to Ericsson CS5, for example. It, it was a product. It was to build a product that enabled the CSP right from the start, out of the box, converged, billing, but everything from sales, order, orchestration to cash, essentially. The entire uh, life cycle of that uh, service delivery model. And we positioned the system and we built the system so that it was uh, it was agnostic. We didn't care what network we were talking to. We weren't built on some sort of legacy IN. And when it was positioned to operators, it was positioned as a product with a, uh, 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 um, uh, with a roadmap and an evergreen software model. Uh, and the advantages of that approach are in the delivery, rapid implementation, because it is pre-integrated, um, low total cost of ownership. You know, we're not having to get our CRM system talking to our billing system. Everything works out of the box. We are an agile delivery organization. Uh, and that means we can then deliver that sort of telco in a box within you know six to nine months of contract signature um and we have a number of proof points around the world i mean we're supporting 90 plus customers you know uh, with subscriber bases up to about three million and for a company of 250 employees that's that's a that's a positive story for us um on the side sort of adjacent to that capability uh, that bss oss capability is our subscription billing and that is leveraging the capabilities that we built on our own BSS stack, but targeted towards other industry verticals like digital print, media, healthcare, telemedicine, that sort of thing. So it, it's taking, we've always felt that telecoms was one of the most complex, most complicated industries to service. And uh, taking that experience and pointing it at other industries was, was a, a good way to take advantage of the subscription economy. Um, Last slide on, on us as, a, as an organization, um, just because it's something I like to brag about. Um, if, if you're familiar with Gartner, and some may be, some may not, Gartner every year have their magic quadrant, and we featured in the last three years under the visionary category. Um, but uh, Gartner did something interesting very recently where they created a peer insights review which essentially opened up all of the entrance to the magic quadrant to a sort of public forum. So, and you can see a, a screenshot of that. Um, and for the last two years, for customer satisfaction, we have come top two years running. So our customers think we're doing something right in the delivery of our software, in the maintenance of it, the support they get from us, our roadmap, et cetera. Um, but it is publicly accessible, so we will circulate the slides after the after the webinar, and you can you can drill down and query and, and look at the look at the information yourselves. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we we work very closely with the TM Forum as well. You know, we are a, 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 a you know, services based organization. We are a, a software that is open uh, in terms of its architecture. Uh, so we subscribe to the TM Forum Open API manifesto. And last two years, we've been the recipient of the TM Forum Catalyst Award. So the last project we did with the TM Forum was um, working with Salesforce and working with Nokia on how to monetize 5G network slices with a particular focus on esports and uh, gaming, mobile gaming. Um, so it is an interesting case study, and it's very applicable to the 5G topic that we're looking at today. So onwards and upwards. The, the, so, so the 5G space, a um, few, few, few points to cover here just at the outset. So I think the 5G proposition generally needs to be approached in a radically different way if, if CSPs really wish to capitalize on this new technology. In their current format, um, CSPs are unable, I think, to compel or adequately proposition the benefits of 5G purely in terms of speed, latency to the average consumer. Shock horror. Most people don't want to spend $70, $80 for a 5G service when 4G will suffice. Uh, and, and where I think the challenge with 4G was this sort of gradual erosion of their service via these sort of OTT players, and you can track that in, in, in their 
the performance of operator stock over the over the sort of the four year uh, sorry 4G technical life cycle. Um, in light of the investment required for 5G, which is unfortunately more than 4G, um, there is, I think, a great unwillingness um, uh, at, at the moment, certainly for consumers, to take on that extra burden uh, and that extra cost. Um, but that, that then has to motivate the CSP into a rapid transformation. Um, so I guess as an answer to that challenge, operators can no longer afford to act simply as connectivity providers to a part of their business or to a particular segment. They have to be much more flexible. Um, and instead, they need to act as uh, an ecosystem enabler. Uh, and they need to own, and I, I, I heard this at MWC last year, they need to act as, as the, val they need to own the value chain, essentially, end to end. That, that's, that's how they make up for the, transitionary loss, should we say, as they moved away from 4G. So they have to monetize partners. They have to have stakeholders onboarded onto their BSS. They need to introduce indirect monetization mechanisms, such as sponsored data. Um, and this is the only way in which they can achieve any ROI on the infrastructure. And whether that's you go radio, you go core transport, and you go the whole hog, because 5G is different depending on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, from a from a network standpoint, so with every technological cycle, uh, you know, operators are forced eventually in having to provide new technology and services to their customer base, regardless of whether or not it is in in, in high demand. Um, and and this is one of the I guess the catch 22s that CSPs or as they become DSPs. Uh, are, are faced with. They need to move. They need to invest. What do they invest in? I can't just go selling off 5G services and 5G handsets to my, my usual customers anymore because they don't want to pay that kind of money, nor do they have a need for it. I need to now completely re-gear my business so that I can provide a services platform or some sort of mechanism where I can onboard enterprises and service enterprises as well as my usual business. Uh, and that's kind of where the sort of BSS system comes in, because the, the, and this sort of shows that I, I guess the sort of near term use cases and the long term use cases that are coming out of the 5G space and, and some I think are, 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 are almost with us, actually. I mean, it, to, 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 you know, how about this? Let, let me start off very, very briefly outlining the sort of service based opportunities. So you, augmented AR, VR, absolutely. And that, that I would say was an enhancement of the existing co um, connectivity services. Wireless broadband, um, immersive content like HD streaming, uh, third party onboarding and revenue sharing, um, and then digital assistance for digital workers. But then on the, I guess on the, the far right, you've got the long-term use cases, and that is massive connectivity, IoT, uh, low latency, peak data rate for remote surgery. It's, uh, and an interesting one for me actually, is, is edge processing. So network edge, um, uh, network edge mo enhanced um, uh, connectivity and, and, and data processing, but on the network edge rather than backhauling it to a data center somewhere. Uh, and then smart city. Uh, and in the Middle East in particular, there is a big focus on smart city now in places in Saudi Arabia. So there's a new city called Neom, uh, which is being built uh, in the desert uh, out of nowhere. And it is a new uh, it is a new um, it is a new venture by the Saudi government as part of their Vision 2020 program. And then in Egypt, you have the administrative capital for urban development. Uh, so both very significant projects, uh, very public, but examples of where I think, I think in the next five to 10 years, you're going to see the, these sort of smart city, massive connectivity requirements required of the 5G network. But so what then, I guess, becomes the enablers for all of these digital new services? Bearing in mind now that operators are focused on, on building an architecture for agile, an agile services business. Um, so network slicing, and I've sort of got them down here. Uh, I, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's uh, right down at the bottom in the purple box. Uh, network slicing, uh, well, this is a new architectural feature designed to improve and enable new ways to monetize that network. 
So with that technology, you, you essentially move away from providing a homogenous spectrum or you rely, you, you know, and this reliance on quality of service attributes within the diameter feed off of the network. But instead, you slice the network into service orientated chunks, logical chunks, each one having different characteristics, uh, low latency, peak data rates, for example. Um, but the, all of these logical slices are, are detached, but they sit on the same physical infrastructure. Um, so from CSP's point of view, it grants them the ability to differentiate themselves through application driven slices uh, so that they can market those network characteristics to their end customers. Another one which I mentioned earlier was edge computing. So and, and this is a real value chain enabler from my point of view, because that now means the business doesn't just sell the connectivity services. It also sells compute resources and those compute resources can be then leveraged or resold to other business entities or service providers or users who, who want to access those compute resources as well as a network. So a good example of that would be, um, and this is something I think we will see very shortly. 5G's just come out and it's typical that the, 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 let's say the infrastructure owners will want to hold on to that network and present it back to their customers before they let MVNOs attach themselves and, and lease some of that spectrum back down to, to other tenants. But mobile gaming, I think, is a really good example of where we were going to see um, uh, that sort of edge computing use case. Um, you know, the ability to stand up an MVNO, an MVNO tenant that focuses on social gaming will, will require a low latency slice and will probably use edge computing to enhance the experience of their user base. Um, and NFD and SDN, uh, within the BSS space, we don't really care about this so much. I mean, this is, this is, um, it's quite, it hangs quite low in the network for one, but it really is a, the, the, it's a software centric application of networks. So it enables a more intelligent way to handle data traffic in a software based context, as opposed to a physical circuit switched one through, through the network elements itself. Um, and again, it's one of those enablers, but it's not one of those enablers that is, is necessarily easy to market to a, a business necessarily. Um, so what are the value propositions that we can then define in the system? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges for digital service providers now is to identify the business models that provide them with that, that 5G edge. Um, and 5G enablers will count for nothing if a DSP is unable to hone in on the B2C, the B2B and the B2B2X models that will fit these new use cases going forward. So according to the CTO, CTIO outlook for 2020, DSPs need to address several uncertainties and variables in order to be successful. But the models most DSPs will fall into, I think will comprise the ones highlighted blue in the middle. So the connectivity business model. So this is pretty much an extension of where DSPs are at to date. It's selling 5G services to their existing customer base, but with add-ons. Uh, so it'll sell the usage service, it will sell the handset, but it will then say, well, we'll, we'll send you a, an HD streaming package as well, or we'll sell, sell you a balance which lasts an hour and you'll be able to stream uh, a, a football game uh, on site in full VR so you can wear a, a Samsung headset gear headset and be transported to the to the goal line of your you know uh, of the, the the World Cup for example it's that and you pay a premium for that and that service will last for a very short space of time um, or it, it's an extension of the loyalty and the reward scheme so you you buy these these new enhanced services HD device streaming, and the more you consume on my network, the more loyalty points you get, and then you can redeem them for additional services. And you can start to see the ecosystem forming. It becomes more of a, I guess, more of a platform. Um, and, and that's that's where I, I think DSPs are really going to have to focus. If they, if they are going to be connectivity business models using a 5G network, they have to leverage those features and upsell them uh, alongside existing existing services. The partnership business model is, is an interesting one as well. And this is one that I think the two would have to go hand in hand in order for the DSPs to be relevant. Uh, and that is 
basically, and we see, we see this today, it is coupling uh, content providers or other services or financial services into the, into the mobile offer, into the mobile package. So HBO or Netflix, uh, they're very common. And if you're a mobile only operator, it enforces stickiness. It means the user is less likely to go away because they are getting some other value add. Uh, and again, having the, the BSS that enables you to not only manage your own devices, but create an ecosystem for a partner and you can sell the access to the catalog to a partner so that they can manage their own products and services is advantageous. But also it, it's absolutely critical uh, if, if the, the CSP wants to stay relevant because the 5G space also lends itself, particularly when VNOs start popping up, uh, to a very crowded market potentially and having the right partners and the right stakeholders is just going to enhance uh, the proposition to the end consumer. And then I think in, in, in further down the line, we, we start to look at more complicated, I think more complicated structures, more complicated arrays of models that, that I think CSPs will gradually evolve into. And that, and that is where they become content delivery as well as providing their own connectivity services. So we move from that core competence uh, to offering not only content, but sponsored data, financial services, and, and they really uh, position themselves as outlets um, to also understand, you know, consumer behavior. So they, they, will, they will then do targeted advertising or they will sell some of that revenue back to the advertisers. So that, that, that's, again, a more advanced iteration of, of the, of the, of the uh, digital service provider. Uh, and last but not least, uh, it's an extension of that. But here the DSP becomes, within the platform business model, the DSP becomes uh, essentially not only the provider of access to services and digital assets, but they're selling it across a gateway layer. Uh, they're opening up their entire ecosystem, catalog, charging, billing, um, and they're opening it up through TM4 and open APIs. And they are charging for that access, whether through an API metering model or standard data usage based models, uh, or and much like an app store, they are also um, taking a cut of the revenue earned by the onboarded tenants. Okay, I will uh, press on. So um, we're gonna look at the sort of demo in a short while. Um, this, this is a, an example of some of the, the um, relationships that we're expecting to see within that sort of partnership model. So this is a contractual relationship that you have with BMW, uh, and it is depicting the wholesale and retail rated events that you would then charge for and bill back to BMW and all of their service providers. So this is a classic, bit more detail, uh, but a classic model of how that partnership model would look within a single instance of the BSS. Uh, and this is where it is absolutely fundamental now for operators to look, you know, seriously at their BSS stacks as they exist to date. Can they handle this kind of structure relationship uh, and, and, and how can they manage it? Um, and we'll look at that in, in, the, in the demonstration. So the areas we're really gonna focus in on are the catalog, the CRM, the revenue manager, and the information manager. I'm gonna talk very, very quickly about this because I appreciate you know, we have a limited session and um, I want to spend as much time showing software as possible. Uh, but this is a, a, an application um, map of our platform, uh, mapped against TM forum domains. Um, and we are a full stack BSS vendor. So we cover everything from lead to order, all the way down into the billing, all the way down into provisioning and orchestration. So the, 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 the full shooting match, as they say. Um, and we're gonna focus on some of the key areas highlighted red that I think are going to be very fundamental for managing customers. So I'm just gonna move away from the slides now and uh, jump straight into a, a, a demonstration session. Can you now see my screen?
So uh, let me let me start very quickly again. So we're we're looking at the uh, the product catalog, and uh, the aim of this product catalog was, as I as I mentioned earlier, was designed to provide uh, the business with the capabilities to manage product lifecycle themselves and not bypass it off to IT. Um, it also uh, presented the business with a full blown wizard and a UI to be able to control the build process, but also fully multi tenanted as well. The access rights can be driven directly through the GUI or through an identity access management system like Keycode. Uh, and so within the access rights, you could create all of your different tenants, uh, all your different partners who you're selling access into the catalog, and they can then jump into uh, a build process. And I'm just going to very quickly dash through this. Uh, they can very quickly go off and graphically create um, all of the rules around the products that they were looking to sell. So in this case, what you have here is the, uh, the IoT catalog. Uh, all of the different IoT devices that I am selling within my DSP uh, and all of the different devices themselves. And against each of these nodes is a uh, property uh, configuration parameter. But what's interesting about the catalog in itself is the fact that not only are you defining how the product is sold, I think more importantly, it's, it's the fact that you don't need to have all of the information right at the outset. Um, so for example, if I clear that screen very quickly and I want to go off and start creating something from, from, from the start, all I have to do is drag and drop the properties that I'm trying to configure. So let's say I want to create a new bundle or package, a new 5G mobile service. Let's say we're in the sort of connectivity uh, realm of the business, and I want to provision it to a, a low latency slice of the network. So I can provision that the service type is the calls out to our service manager, and that service manager module houses the service order catalog and the provisioning logic down to the uh, down to the network element. Um, and then I can leave other properties blank. So uh, let's just call that five G usage service. Let's give it some data. So let's say I leave the product code blank. Obviously, a red asterisk is something that has to be mandatory and uh, has to be filled in. So it's detected a change. So now we're on version 77 of this new catalog. And now I can go and add things to it. So I'm creating a package. So it's a combination of things. It gives the user the ability to select options and build things in a bespoke way. Uh, so I have to have a minimum of one product and a maximum of four. Now we're defining business rules about that particular product itself. Um, and then I have a wizard. So every time I right click on the node itself, I can add new pieces to that puzzle or I can add existing configuration. But it, at every point in the build process, the system is coming back and saying, well, this is what I think you need. Uh, and that's where it is tuned towards providing the capability for the business because it's the business who are going to be using this, not IT. In the past, and I remember this from doing projects, you had to have a very concrete, crystallized view of what you wanted to sell, who it was going to be sold to, how much it was going to cost, how it was going to be provisioned, et cetera. Uh, and this is a very different concept. This is enabling the business to very rapidly prototype that particular product. Um, and you can see from the, the properties on the far left, how deep this catalog goes. It goes right into the charging system, right into service determinations, uh, right into things like the network services that we are going to provision for this particular product, right into taxation rules and discounting features, so real-time discounting. So it is quite a comprehensive top to bottom in terms of that product configuration with the aim, with one of the principal aims of reducing the time to market. Um, and subsequently also en enabling and allowing access so that other people can build their own things, their own services, their own offers within an ecosystem. Uh, so let's carry on very quickly on, on this on this build. I'm conscious we have sort of 10 more minutes before we go into the Q&A, but I, I will push on. Um, so if we look at this product and package, so we've got a number of different product option types. So I could be selling a piece of equipment, I could be selling a chargeable item, additional service, it could be a one-off discount, so we've got a number of different property types, and this is an extensible database. So if I click on the plus there, 
We can very quickly add new product types into that catalog. So it gives the CSP, DSP flexibility to tackle new and different service types that it wants to sell. Yeah, uh, uh, they might be selling rack space, email access, data center services. It's going to be a whole host of things that they're going to be selling as part of this new ecosystem. Uh, and, and you need the catalog to be flexible enough, adaptable to be able to do that. So let's say, so let's say it's a, a, a usage service, so that's something that can be provisioned off the network. I can, I can relate that to existing products, so we have a concept of inheritance within the catalog. Um, and then we'll say it's a mobile service. Actually, we're going to say it's a low latency slot. And then we're going to give it some product code and a description. And then we'll go a little bit further. So then we want to add a charge to that. So now we're in the billing. We're defining retail charges, rental charges, subscription charges, activation charges, upgrade charges. Um, it's here where we're also, you know, we can also attach a wholesale charge. So when you come to do reporting, you can do margin analysis. So we'll just have a monthly service charge. We'll provision that, we'll set that for 12. So that's a monthly charge, 12 months in a year. And then we'll define things like general ledger codes. You've got contract rules here, penalties for breach of contract. In the, in, there's been a recent accounting change where we have to also recognize revenue immediately on a, on a bundled product. So that's a, a very important uh, financial, um, financial change that's come in through the accounting standards. Uh, and things like forcing credit checks for high value products as well. So all of these are flags and triggers and rules, business rules that pass into the BSS, pass into the sale of that product. Um, and then here you can have a third party payment type as well. So that's uh, being triggered by uh, a Netflix or a BMW. And then when we come to do the revenue share model with them, that product is flagged at whatever wholesale rate that we have for, for the relationship that we, we manage with BMW or Netflix or whatever when it comes to, comes to the revenue share agreements. So we've got a mobile service. Now maybe I want to go and add a balance. So we carry on down the tree. Now we're starting to go into the charging world. So we're going to have a daily recurrence plan. So this is a 24-hour balance. Um, and, and like I said at the start, we can go lower than that. You know, within our roadmap, we will be supporting hourly balances, which I think are a very interesting concept, particularly for high, you know, I'd say high value add-ons to a 5G usage service. You know, being able to access the 5G network for an hour so you can stream something in HD, I think is going to be one of those connectivity add-ons it's going to be very, very valuable for a DSP going forward. Um, so within that concept, then we've got our daily charge, and then we want to add in our uh, our balances as well. Uh, and that, that becomes fundamental. And here I've got an example of uh, a triple play product uh, as well. So this is, this is an example of where we're not just selling a mobile product, we're selling something that is convergent. It has got mobile elements to it, it's got the handset, it's got the fixed line. If I click on the down, I can see all of the breakup of that product. So here I'm looking at equipment and I'm looking at the discounted charges associated with it. Um, and you might have segmentation logic against that as well. So you might say, well, I only want to sell that to a particular, uh, to a particular user group. Uh, and that's going to be very fundamental. DSPs are going to have lots of different categorizations of customers. And they will only want to be able to sell particular products to particular customers. And that's why we have segmentation rules to be able to push within the channel the right product for the right person or the right user uh, or the right circumstance, um, geography, for example. Uh, and, and being able to define those segmentation rules within the catalog for that Google pan set, for example, is, is absolutely fundamental. So here you've got some different uh, different channels and different account subgroups that that product can be linked to. Uh, so how then how then does that sort of tie in with with the, the the CRM channel, for example? So I can very quickly. So if I go back, very very forget the changes I've made. Let's roll back to the earlier version because I've I've done a lot of changes that I've not uh, completed. Uh, so let's revert that version back. Uh, and let's do a very quick change on 
the catalogue and see that come through in the channel itself. So I'm just going to go back to that triple play product. I will use the search here at the top actually to do that. So there we go. And let's say I just want to change that monthly charge. Let's change it to 69.99 for example. And then save that. So that's going to create a new version. Just going to give it a new effective date. Now, as part of that process comes the validation. And the validation is what enables us to move the business into the catalog uh, as, a as opposed to uh, leaving it within the sort of realm of the IT uh, world. So this has come back and said, well, everything's fine. It's fully validated. You've had no errors. You've got some warnings, but they're informational only. So that then enables me, the business, to go off and publish that catalog set to the channel that I've chosen. And I just want to publish the changes I've made. So there you go. And this is showing the change that I made to the price. So now I can go ahead and publish that. That will then publish to CRM, and then we'll go and look at our handiwork in CRM. So off we go. So now I'm in CRM land. So this is one of the channels I've published to. And again, the CRM is a multi tinted tool. Different users have different rights, different extensible permissions, different page access, different field level access. And this is where, as again, your MVNO tenants, your unsophisticated MVNO tenants are going to be accessing that system. They're going to be looking to buy that service from you to manage their customers. Um, and, and that is where I think also CSPs are going to have to walk that fine line between wholesaler and retailer for certain customers. So they're a wholesaler for their MVNO tenants, but they're a retailer or a reseller for, for their own customers. But it needs a flexible BSS with a flexible billing system that can be able to handle those different different models. Um, so let's just look at the work we've done. So I'm going to go in. So we've gone into an account. We've gone in and looked at these are all of the services on the account. These are these are access numbers. So these this account is has got a number of different uh, mobile services attached to it. Um, and what I'm doing now, all I'm doing is simply going in and creating a new sale. I'm going into the browse, uh, which is basically looking into the catalog that we've just changed. There's some address validation here, but that tends to be more for the fixed line services rather than pure mobile. But this is a demonstration environment, so there are there are facets here that, that relate to fixed line or certain conversion products. Uh, so I'm then just going to pick an address out, that should be fine. And then uh, I'm going to go into my combined office because this was the catalog where I made that change. It was called Cyrillicon Complete, and then we should have we should be able to pick up that change on the price, 69.99, 82.24 with tax, but it was yeah 69.99. And then you can see the representation of that product through the CRM, and I can pick that, <coughs> take that to the basket. I can sell more than one. I can do sort of multi sales, um, and if I'm doing CPQ. Uh, where I'm managing estimates as opposed to just a standard sale, I can track the probability. I can track the value in the stage it's at and their anticipated close date. And then I can I can report on that as well. So we have a fully integrated reporting module as well within the BSS. And again, it's accessible uh, as a tenant, just as it is for the main uh, main CSP, main DSP. Uh, so VNOs, uh, your, your, your other partners who will be using the BSS or querying the BSS programmatically over the APIs will be able to access the reporting. Will be able to do uh, drill downs into the data, into the data set. So here we're looking at a, a sales funnel for for various products. Uh, you've got the opportunity by salesperson. You've got the value, the probability, and the, you can build these yourselves. These are widgets. So there's a separate tool, uh, the Cerulean Business Insights tool, which enables you to build all of these different graphical widgets and pass them into, uh, into the CRM um, and create triggers and alerts based on, based on um, a, number of, a number of properties, so trouble tickets, for example. If your trouble tickets exceed 10 in a given month, 
uh, create a, an alert, send that report to a group of people or an individual or a department. Um, and then you can drill down on that data as well. So if I want to look at that account, which has a, has a, a value of two and a half million uh, in sales, just click on the link and it hyperlinks me to it. Uh, and then I can go and look at the baskets or look at the estimates that have been created against that account. And so that's, that's so we've started off with a catalog uh, and then we've moved uh, straight into, into the CRM and, and we've shown how those two are tied very tightly together. Um, and then we've also looked at how the reporting works, uh, which is part of that sort of information manager suite. Um, what we haven't looked at perhaps is, is the hierarchy for the billing. Uh, so I'm just gonna spend a bit of time talking about billing, but not too long because uh, we, I need to leave some time for Q&A. So I'm just gonna move to an account, type it correctly. And I will, here we go. So this is a corporation as opposed to an individual. So this corporation called First Sight has a very complicated structure. Um, and one of the one I think one of the other major uh, major major um, qualities of the BSS going forward is the ability to manage complex corporate structures, uh, rolled up billing, complex hierarchies. And so if I go in and look at that that customer hierarchy, if I click on view, you can look at their hierarchy, and I can look at how each of the different accounts relate to one another. Uh, I can also capture what we call uh, out of context relationships. So Janet here, for example, doesn't she's got no legal relationship. Uh, she's not being chased for a debt accrued by First Corporation, but she works for the company. So a CSR uh, uh, contact center rep, that's, that's information that's useful. Um, but here, what we're seeing on this screen is the billing relationship. It, we're showing the organizational relationship and who or which account is receiving the bills for charged services. Um, uh, and that is stacked uh, in a way such that all of the accounts here at the top, parent accounts, they are receiving the, the charges, uh, rated usage events, one-off transaction fees uh, for all of this, uh, the child accounts falling beneath it. Uh, and so that's again an important factor uh, in being able to manage complex hierarchies within your architecture, uh, within your billing, uh, and at the same time being able to do the, the, the financial revenue share between each of these different accounts. Um, and then frankly, it's also the ability to actually report on it as well, because things like commissions, um, that, that is a function of reporting more so than anything else. Uh, so when you have um, gone through your month end and you're reporting on the number of transactions or the total transaction amounts that you've sold for rental charges, for example, for a particular account um, or a particular product, you need to be able to also aggregate all of the commissions that are owed for a particular entity or salesperson or however your commissions are structured. Uh, and that then is passed to the ERP and then paid out through the ERP or the HR system. Um, but it's the fact that you need to be able to report and track that spend and track those sales and track that billing over time. Um, and again, reporting becomes such a fundamental vehicle for enabling that. It has to be integrated. It has to be uh, transparent. Uh, and it has to be, you know, you, you have to be able to interrogate it. Uh, and and by having a convergent solution where we have a single database wrapped across all of these different modules, it, it enables us to do that with a great, you know, with a, um, a real degree of uh, accuracy and accountability uh, and assurance. And, um, uh, and that, again, is a, an important factor in the BSSOS OS domain. Um, we, we've got 10 minutes left, uh, and I've, I feel I've covered off all of the, the areas of the system I wanted to show, albeit briefly, but I hope it, it's given you a flavor and a sense of where we are at with our, with our BSS OSS system. Um, so now I'm sort of opening up the, 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 the floor to questions. And if I can show stuff in the system uh, as a way of answering questions, I, I absolutely will. Um, but yes, please, please fire away. And um, any, you know, we've got sort of nine minutes left. 
any questions I don't get around to answering, I will um, endeavor to follow up after the session. Uh, this is going to be recorded. So obviously anybody who couldn't make it, they'll still get the recording of it. Um, but if there's anything that you want to revisit as part of the recording, then you can, you're, you, know, you have that liberty. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna minimize this and jump back straight into, into the, uh, stop sharing my screen and okay. Over, over, over to the audience. Okay, James. So there is a question about the enterprise product catalog. Can it be delivered standalone or is it dependent on the rest of the product suite? It absolutely can be delivered as a standalone module. Uh, we've designed it that way. It is completely, whilst it talks natively to our downstream systems, um, it, it is. it has an open source uh, publication mechanism which enables us to then talk to other systems can you offer any products uh, with contracts do you have a contract management functionality within your system absolutely yeah we have a a full-blown advanced contract management system uh which i i can i can very quickly show you so we we looked at it very quickly in the context of the catalog um but we also have the ability to define contract templates as well so we have an administrator portal uh, which i'm just going to go into now can oh let me just share my screen hang on i'm gonna make the same mistake i did last time uh, right. Okay. So I'm just going to hop into my administrator and then within the context of that administrator, uh, I have all of my contracts um, and we, we present these digitally as part of the sales flow. So I can go in and see all of the rules attached to a particular contract. Uh, the upgrade downgrade conditions, the penalty conditions, the term conditions, uh, any, you know, the amounts for penalty or for breaching a contract uh, and the template itself, i.e. the document that the contract is made up of. So this is a 12 month contract. If I go into the template itself, I can go and see that particular contract presented on screen with all of the placeholder variables and the right. And so, um, when I sell a product, um, I'm obviously taking the information that I've added into the CRM for account name, first name, last name, address, et cetera, and they are then presented in the contract. And then we can support digital signature, uh, sign on glass or Adobe sign or, or, or that sort of thing. And then it is stored in our document management system as a, as a PDF. they're asking if the system supports corporate and residential accounts all on same system or is it through you know is there a different way of doing it would you like to expand on that of course so we manage everything within a convergent system so when we create a customer we are selecting what that customer type is right at the start of the, pro the onboarding process and we, we've worked with other CRM vendors as well. So we in, in and, and this sort of goes back to that point about can modules be decoupled from the overall architecture? And, and the answer is yes. We've got you know, something in the order of about 720 APIs, SOAP APIs around the stack. Uh, and then we also have uh, 16 or 17 TM forum REST APIs. And those who are familiar with their sort of open API manifesto and it's an ongoing journey. So we're, as we are, we're sort of moving lockstep with the, the TM forum in that domain. Um, to circle back to the question, um, when I create a customer, I can create and define what kind of customer that is, whether it's residential or corporate. So I have a, a customizable screen here that relates to the particular operator and that we configure. Uh, as part of the, the delivery of the system. And then we, we work with you to define these configurable sales flows. 
Uh, so this has got 11 steps and it's actually a lead creation as opposed to a customer, but it does highlight the point that yes, we store both types, lots of customer categorization at the account level, at the customer level, at the service level, at the equipment level. Okay. Well, if there are no further... Yeah. Was there another question? So if there are no further questions, um, I think I'll bring the session to a close. Um, like I said, we'll be distributing the handout, the presentation, and a recording of the video. And um, uh, so if, if any questions come in uh, uh, after the event, um, I'll, be, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, but otherwise, thank you for your time. Uh, we're finishing a little earlier. Um, but uh, it, it's, been, yeah, it's been great. Thank you very much.